use a Java-based site can be regarded as more trouble than it's worth, and that's really unfortunate. But the good news is that the community behind JMod are so active in their efforts that they've produced an alternative JS mod, which runs only using JavaScript. You don't need Java anymore. And it essentially does the same thing. And today is going to be the first time that the general public oh, done that, have seen Kenshin 3D version running JS mod. It's not quite finished, and I hope it works all right today. But uh, if it doesn't, that's because it's not quite finished. So the sorts of things that a chemist is interested in I've listed a few things here, I'm not going to read them out. Most of you, if you're chemistry students, will recognise. In fact, let's just have a show of hands. How many chemists are there? Can you see a hand in the air if you're a chemist, if you're not ashamed to be a chemist? Go again. And those of you who are not a chemist, you are what? Phys physicists, biologists? Shout. Biochemists. Biochemists. Okay, that's close enough. That'll do. <laughs> so, you're not a biochemist. So, if I go back to around just a few too quickly there, the Motivation is all these concepts within chemistry, not all organic chemistry, as we'll see. And they all require knowledge about chemistry, but also they require thinking in three dimensional space. And that's the challenge for certainly our students, but I think for students generally. And so what we wanted to do was to try and convey the interest and excitement in some of those ideas in a very easily understood way. So the idea was to produce interactive visualisation. So this is an example of an interactive, it's not interactive on the slide, but a version of an elimination mechanism. And the thinking is that if you could create something, it would work really well in a lecture environment, because you can blow something up. I hope to demonstrate that in a few minutes. But it would also work very well for private study, because students can work on their own, analysing the situation and making their own judgments about what's important, using it as a, as a resource. And that in turn will promote deeper understanding of the material. And it leads to this idea of what I'm calling an open-ended investigation. You don't have to do what I tell you with Chemtune 3 d or these other resources. You can decide what you want to do. You can decide what bond angles you want to measure or bond lengths you want to measure to understand better what's going on. <coughs> Chemtune 3 d has grown astonishingly over the last few years. It's now more than 800 HDMI pages, so it's very big. And that's why not all the pages are guaranteed to work today, so I haven't a chance to check. So you can show electrostatic surfaces in 3D, you can show molecular orbitals, there's a faintly calculated molecular orbital laid on top of a cartoon molecular orbital for a molecule of benzene. You can display molecules in motion, vibrations, that's ammonia with the uh, fundamental modes displayed. And you can even look at uh, inorganic structures like this one and think about the coordination sphere around the ions. Structure. So the, the, the types of structures that you can display is essentially limitless as long as you've got the fundamental coordinates then j will display that really nicely for you. And we led on to polymers and dendrites, which I'll finish with. So I want to say a little bit about transition states. This is a very important concept for chemical reactions. It's the energy maximum between starting materials and products, and you have to get to that point in order to, for the reaction to occur. And this is the representation of a saddle point, which indicates this is the direction from the front to the back, or vice versa which is the path that the molecule has to traverse in terms of energy. And that everything else is at a minimum at this point, but the one path is a maximum. That's the characteristic of the transition state. One path is the lowest energy, uh, sorry, is the, is the uh, lowest barrier, and everything else is at a minimum. So mathematically, you can model that situation for essentially any reaction you want. And what we've increasingly discovered is that the range of reactions we've been able to investigate has just grown and grown, to the point where we believe wrongly that we could take on almost any well-known organic chemistry reaction. And if you take a really well-known and rather trivial organic chemistry reaction, the nucleophilic substitution process, on methyl iodide, in comes a nucleophile, get this transition state. That's the key thing. That's the point that we have to calculate using the molecular modeling software. We use Spartan for this. And you can calculate that, and then some more very clever mathematics allows you to walk from this peak back towards the starting materials and on towards the product. And so a mathematical routine actually calculates the goat walking over the mountain path from the starting materials up and over to the transition state and on to the product. And that's the process that we carry out whenever we want to produce an animated sequence of a reaction. And each point on this curve merely corresponds to the coordinates of each of the atoms involved in that particular sequence. That's a very simple reaction, but it illustrates the point of the transition state in its importance. Now, the, the, the abbreviation I haven't defined, IRC just stands for intrinsic reaction coordinate. That's the process of calculating from the transition state down to the two 
state. So that's the key to our success. So rather than always talk about how you can do interesting things, I thought it would be much more interesting if I actually showed you KEMTU3D in action so that you can begin to see how the sorts of problems that I've outlined at the start can actually be solved. And here is a, a, a semi-live version of KEMTU3D. It's running off my laptop here. And what you need to notice is that the top level navigation is broken down into five sections, and those are, I'm going to be talking about uh, four of those essentially. Um, there's also a search function which will search the whole site, and so by keyword, any word you want to search for, that's very effective. In the lecture this morning, I asked to pull up an animation, I couldn't remember where it was, so I just searched for it and it found it as the top bit of that word. So I drive into organic reactions. I say I'm an organic chemist, I've written a book about organic chemistry, so you'll have to forgive me for the extent of the organic reactions that we've got in the left-hand navigation there. Essentially, all the organic reactions you've ever heard of, and then some, I suspect. And each of those is, is broken down into a subsection, but I just wanted to pick on the elimination. So I'll pull that and get that to work. So this is the point about how molecules change their shape as they react. And the way that you interact with this site is that you look at, for a conventional representation you find in the textbook, like at the bottom here, this is a reaction mechanism drawn out in the usual way, and you just click on what you like. So if you click on the, the structure with a curly arrow, click that, you get a three-dimensional version with a curly arrow, and because it's uh, in general, you can interact with it, you can change the way it looks. Now, for a lecturing purpose, I usually like to make it as big as possible, so I'll just clone that out into a much bigger window, and you can see that particular molecule, which is tertiary butyl bromide. Those of you who joined me for dinner earlier will know that I'm not a very fan of nomenclature, so let's just call that the tertiary bromide. In terms of its reactivity, what happens is the bromine just falls off. So the bond stretches and breaks, and you produce an iron pair, which has a positively charged cation and a negatively charged bromine. But if you watch what happens to that carbon as that reaction occurs, I'm just going to get to run back and forth. If we do that, there we go. You can see that in the product it's flat, completely flat, whereas in the starting material it's the shape of a cave. And so there is a change in hybridization illustrated in the I also mentioned an interfix substitution, so let's see an example of that. We'll take a simple SN2. And this is the analogue of that reaction I just had on the screen. And again, if you pick on bromide replacing chloride, it's not an interesting reaction, but it illustrates the point. If I blow that up, and then animate the process, you can see that the brown bromide comes in and expels the chloride. Now, the interesting thing about chemists is that we use different representations for atoms. There's a very old-looking periodic table there. That's a very well-established way of representing different elements with chemical symbols. In 3D, you can't afford to have alphabet spaghetti all over your molecules, so we use colour instead. But because this is a computer-based system, if I just pause that or stop it and hover over an atom of unknown type, you can see that it will tell me that's a chlorine, if I wasn't actually sure about that, and it will tell me that that's a bromine in exactly the same way. So I get that going again. The beauty of this is a three-dimensional animation is that you can move it, you can view it down that axis and see that it's a completely linear process. You can look at the centre of that carbon, how that's reacting, and you can see it turns inside out. That's the process of inversion of stereochemistry, which is something that's very difficult to depict without some kind of related <coughs> signals. I'll do... No, I won't do one more. I'll get back to this. So there are a whole range of organic chemistry reactions that we could look at, and I've picked three of them. We'll do one, one more, which is a much more complicated example. Uh, this is the miseroki heck process, which involves palladium catalysis, and you can see the reaction scheme is more complicated. It's a catalytic cycle. But the principle is exactly the same. If you want to see the opening step of the catalytic cycle, the oxidative addition, this is bromobenzene reacting with palladium with a phosphine on it. It's a very, very small phosphine. Normally it would be triphenyl phosphine or something like that. That would make the calculations much slower and it would also clutter up the window. So we don't do that. We just have to be simple phosphine. Nevertheless, the oxidative addition process goes quite nicely. And we end up with a palladium sitting in what looks like a square planar arrangement with one of the ligands missing here. And then that goes on in the next step, reacting with alkene. And the carbon palladation, 
showing the sin stereochemistry, if any of you studied that, you'll recognise it. And on we go with beta hydro elimination, where palladium grounds the hydrogen and will produce the alkene. So that's a heck reaction, and you can imagine going around that sort of catalytic cycle. So as I've indicated, we have more of those than you could ever possibly want, really, in terms of organic reactions. But it illustrates the general process of producing that kind of animated system. But it's not restricted to organic chemistry by any means. There are also inorganic structures which are difficult to understand. And this is such an example, I'm informed by my inorganic colleagues, that spinel is a structure that often leads to confusion among students. So I thought, and looking at it just there, I think you can sympathize with it. It's not very clear what's going on. So what we wanted to do was show these solid state structures in 3D. We wanted to pick out key features, like the unit cell that make up these three-dimensional lattices. We wanted to emphasize the coordination polyhedra around individual ions. So you can see those are tetrahedra based around the individual ions. And build them together so that you have one type of tetrahedron in grey, so what of those optical effect problem in grey, and the yellow tetrahedron showing exactly how they fit together. And we wanted to make this process, like the organic chemistry, intuitive, so that if you landed on this web page from the internet at large, you'll be able to work out what to do. You don't have to follow the manual. We do have instructions, but nobody ever reads them. I know that from the analytics. People just use the site as is, and that's great. The structure's generated from Material Studio. Jay Moll does the visualization. And we use scripting to dictate exactly what the users see. Now, this is what you typically get in an organic uh, textbook, so the internet <coughs> website. This is sodium chloride. That's a fairly well-behaved structure. I think that all of those diagrams are fine. But if you get to something like perovskite, which again is one of these legendary, more difficult structures, it's very hard, based on those static images, to work out what's really going on. So what we wanted to do was to improve that. Actually, a lot of the inspiration for this approach came from this department, because two of my colleagues are graduates and PhDs from here, and they, uh, who advised me on this, they, they get <coughs> inspiration from here. So this is an example of the interface. I'll show you it live in a minute. You can see you've got a big chunk of the crystalline material with a series of links on one side that allow you to bring up various structures. So let's have a look at some examples of those. This is the solid state gallery. And the other thing is because this is, this is the new beta version of the uh, site, it's actually got a whole load of extra information that isn't in the public site. Everything below here is all brand new. It's coming out to support the next edition of Schreiber Atkins. So we have a look first of all at uh, the rock salt structure, which I say is a reasonably sensible one. Sodium ions and chloride ions in a regular cubic lattice, which is a nice chunk of sodium chloride. And you can pick out the coordination uh, octahedra in both cases, so you can see it's a 6 6 I mentioned there. And you can then look at the unit cell and nest the polyhedra together to actually see how they fit to produce the whole three-dimensional matters. And on the live site, there's also a button up here which produces all those views at once, but that's not implemented yet. So that's sodium chloride, and if I can find perovskite, that's one of the advanced structures. That was the example I had a minute ago. And you can see there it is, with the green ions sitting in the middle of the cubes. And again, you can look at the Coordination polyhedra in a system like that, focusing on each of those, both octahedral. And you can look at the unit cell, which is just cubic with the green ions sitting happily in the middle there. And then we can produce the same kind of views. Now that's, that's a different view. Let's look at that one. That's the view that was very similar to the one we saw in 2D a few minutes ago. It's octahedra uh, in a cube with the green ions sitting. And the idea of those different presentations is that you can actually mentally break down the composition of the molecule, so another molecule, a structure like this, and understand how it's built up, thinking about those octahedra, thinking about the cubic relationship. So I've got a collection of those. That's the wrong one. Uh, and we're building in a big way in the, in the inorganic materials for the next release, which should be early in the year. The other area that I want to show you a little bit about is polymers. Uh, they're quite different in that they're very large structures, flexible structures. In order to make this manageable, we chose to just display a single strand in the moment. So one strand of polymer. 
and try and identify the key aspects. So you've got the structural features of it, you've also got repeating units <coughs> in the nature of a column, so you can colour those up nicely. You can pick out the backbone and emphasise the units hanging off it in, in light blue, for example. And you can then zoom right in and have a look at an individual repeating unit, which you get a sense of, in that case, that's an S repeating unit. Of course, you can also manipulate the view however you like to show space filling, to show how the thing packs together. Structurally, that doesn't tell you much, it doesn't tell me much anyway, but it's, that's a more realistic representation in many ways of that particular thing. These were all modeled using uh, Spartan Materials Studio, and we just simply did a confirmation search to try and get an idea of what the structure's like. And I've got a couple of examples to show you these. And that's the wrong thing. So we'll go into that one. Through polymers. And I want to show you polystyrene. Because polystyrene is a polymer that we all know in those dreadful paper polystyrene cups that keep your coffee so warm. And what I wanted to do was just show you what it looks like, roughly. It's a tangled mess, as you'll see in there. So there's the underlying structure. At the moment, I think that's, it's, it's not easy to see what's going on there, is it? You've got some phenyl rings, clearly. Uh, you've got a bit of chain, but it's not that obvious. So what we wanted to do was try and pick out features. So you can pick out the repeating units in that polymer, and then you can begin to see that the repeating unit does exactly that. It just repeats as the styrene polymer joined together in that sequence. And we can zoom right in and have a look at one of those monomeric units. And you can see the rest of the chain is still there. You can also pick out the backbone in green this time, with the blue beads hanging off it. And that's another representation. That's not very realistic, but it illustrates the repeating nature of the monomer unit going on and on and on down the chain. But the confirmation is very important. In fact, this is a little chunk of polystyrene which uh, we were fortunate to find the structure, which shows you that it really is a tangled mess. But when you zoom right in on any part of that structure, you can see that actually the backbone looks quite similar to the little section that we produced. So our, our representation of these polymeric structures as a short chain of monomers may not be so bad as long as you remember that it's coiled up into a much larger structure in reality. And this can be can carry on interacting with this your heart's content. Okay, so I've created this site with the help of a large number of students in Liverpool working through their summer or working as projects during their, their time. And who cares? Who's noticed? Well, the answer is rather lot of you. Because I installed Google Analytics on this website, and they've tracked the activity on the site since it was launched in February uh, 2008. And you can see that in the last year, we had more than 390,000 unique visitors from 190 countries. So it has a, a global reach in terms of people coming to find out about chemistry. It's also growing consistently. Uh, we're up by nearly 50% on 2012. And the recent peak, which was achieved again just last week, uh, 2,000 visits in a single day during the academic year, that's not unusual. So we're seeing people coming in from all over the place to find out more about chemistry. And the interesting question is, how do they find it? How do they know that it's there? There's the map showing where they all come from. The darker the blue, the more common the visitors. So we get an awful lot from the States. Britain, India is very popular as well, and the rest you can see. I've got to hit this area of Africa, I'm not doing well there. The, the graph at the bottom shows how it varies with the seasons. So, <coughs> this is the summer, this is the first semester, this is Christmas, this is the second semester building. The blue line is the most recent year, the yellow line is the year before, and you can see that in November 2012, we had nearly 50,000 visits in one. So, it's, it's very, very widely used, and I'm very interested to know how people get to it, as I say. So I've got a little graph here showing the pie chart, showing you how people find it. The big blue section is internet searching, which is translated into Google. In other words, Google is the principal source of everyone finding chemistry created. You also get a little bit of referral, which means another site hands you on, and a little bit of direct traffic, which is where people actually know where it is and can get it. 
But I know that students particularly will search for something even when they know where it is. Even if they know the URL, they'll still search. So you can see that Google is absolutely critical for the success of any internet-based resource. That's not surprising, but the extent to which that's true originally did surprise me. What about what goes on in the UK? Well, there's a map. I hope you can just about see the outline of the UK there. The bigger the circle, the bigger the activity. And one of the reasons I'm really pleased to be here today is that Oxford is a real hotspot of activity. Liverpool, inevitably, and London. But Ox Oxford really pulls its weight much better than that other place I used to go to. So <laughs> we get 60,000 visits from the UK, from 760 cities, they call them. Uh, in terms of the United States, we have very good coverage, and those of you who know your chemistry departments will not be surprised to see we get lots from California, Texas, and New York State with a bit of uh, Illinois as well. And nearly 100,000 visits from networks identifying themselves as university networks. So it's very popular amongst university students when they get started. You will be pleased to see that Oxford is the number one university network that visits KMC through D, beating even Liverpool. All that shows us that our students work from home. Uh, we, also get, <laughs> we also get plenty of activity from the state of Duke, Illinois, as well as the same paper just there. So it's, it's very widely used, and I'm delighted about that. And as a result of its wide use, I get very positive feedback from our own students. I also get random people writing to me and saying how nice it is and what they like about it, which is great. My colleagues use it, which again is uh, high praise, and it's being added to virtual learning environments around the world. I can tell that again from the statistics. But even now, I feel as though we need to do more. And this is where the linking with the textbook <coughs> idea came from. Because if you create something and it's out on the internet, even with Google, people don't always find it. And so we had a GIST funded project looking at how to optimise the use of Chem 3 d And it was also then part of an open educational resources project. Which means that, which many of you probably know, it's free, everyone can use it, it's guaranteed to be there. So you can build it into your curriculum if you wish. But what it comes down to is, can students around the world actually find your resource if you create it? And this is a Google search for three key words, deals, older, ender. Kate, my embarrassed, who's sitting in the audience, knows a lot about the deals, older, reaction, and the ender, selectivity. This is a, a Google search for that particular topic, and you can see that m 3 d comes in after Wikipedia. So that means that anyone looking for this topic is going to be drawn to using and exploring chem 3 d and our images are also appearing in the Google search. So by having a site that's open, that's the key thing, so everyone can get it, including Google, and producing something that is popular, so it rises up the Google rankings, you create a situation where anyone searching for a particular topic is likely to be offered that as one of their <coughs> first points of call. And that's really what I want to do. But as for drawing formal students of organic chemistry who may be fortunate enough to be using our book, how can I link the two together? How can I get them to go from the book to the website? They actually discover their own part. Well, this is what we did in the second edition. We added this extra little sidebar alerting the reader to the fact that there is a resource in Chem 3D. And all you need to do to go straight to that page is know which page number you're on in the textbook. Now, most students will know which page number they're on because it's printed on every page. So all you need to do then is add a custom URL, type it in, put in the page number, and you will jump straight to the web page that depicts that source. And I know from experience that sending people in through the front door of a website and expecting them to find the relevant bit often ends in failure. But giving them a custom URL will take them straight to the resource they want. It's a much better way to do it. Also, I wanted to do it the other way too. I wanted to send traffic from the website. This is actually one of your pages, Kate, as it happens, uh, where we've got the deals of the reaction starring again. And I wanted to link to the page in the textbook which contains the discussion that's more detailed than is on that web page. And so the idea is you notice that particular icon on the web page, you recognise the textbook, and you go to page 884 and you can read much more. So I'm tying the two ideas together. Does it work? That's the question that everyone would want to know. Do people actually follow these paths? So we've got two graphs here from earlier in the year. 
This is the graph, first of all, which shows the use of the customised URLs. So these are people who've typed in a particular page number with that custom URL and been led to the appropriate page. And you can see that the numbers are not massive, well that was quite big that day, but they're, they're generally not massive, but it's fairly consistent, people are using it all the time. And I think it's reasonable to expect that once someone has been led to the site, they might be able to find their own way around. So it's not actually a requirement that every, you have to use the custom URL every time. So it, yes, it does work, people will use the URLs from the book to get to the website. What about the other way around? This is the traffic going the opposite direction using the page number icons and you can see that the traffic's at a higher level, it's more consistent, people are definitely following this particular link and finding their way back to the relevant page in the textbook. So I believe that I've actually succeeded in tying together the physical resource of the textbook with the ephemeral web-based resource, which is Kenchi3D, in a way that encourages people to use both together. And the success of that is, is such that if you've used Kenchi3D recently, you'll notice that that isn't the only book that has this sort of cross-reference. There's also a book by Burroughs et al. that links Chemistry Cubed, it's called, which links in the same way. And as I mentioned, in the new year, the inorganic chemistry, uh, the former Shriver and Atkins uh, book, which is now being written by authors based in this country, is also going to have the same kind of linking scheme. So we'll have that across the whole of chemistry. So, my conclusions for you this afternoon, this evening I should say. Uh, a wide variety of chemistry can be displayed in 3D in an interactive way that enhances understanding. So it turns the user into an active person rather than a passive consumer. This is really important. Summer students and project students can achieve dramatic results using complex software. Molecular modeling software, web design software, it's not easy. But our students have done a fantastic job with that. So that, that really works. And from the point of view of driving this whole area forward, the ability to use that workforce is extremely important. I benefited from support from the Higher Education Academy UK Physical Sciences Centre by small projects, that, small amounts of money that paid students to work through the summer. Unfortunately, that's in the past tense. That doesn't happen anymore. That's really disappointing. I hope that I've shown you and convinced you that open educational resources, by opening something up to the world, not locking it away behind a password, it allows everybody to have a chance to learn from it. And in turn, you get much more return from your effort rather than just being a niche thing. And I've shown you just a little bit of Google Analytics that allows you to tell exactly what's going on with your own website, see which bits are being used, how long people spend on this. And I hope I've convinced you that open educational resources such as Kenchi 3D actually can be tied to traditional textbooks. So we get the benefits of both worlds. Because believe me, as an author of a textbook, I think nothing beats a really good textbook in terms of a foundation and subject. But updating a textbook is really hard work, I've done it recently. Updating a website, although I haven't completed the beta yet, is comparatively straightforward. You can keep it up to date, keep it current. So I must acknowledge those who've uh, helped me in this project and essentially put me here today. The whole of the Chemtree 3 d team, I used to list names, but there are too many now. We have a team page and uh, they've all done a fantastic job. And the great thing about it is that many of them come back for a second helping. They do one project and they want to come back and do more. So I think it's actually fun. I've also benefited from my colleague Neil Berry, who's a true computational chemist. He really knows what he's doing, and he, he's kept me on the straight and narrow and uh, allowed me to use more sophisticated software when we need to. So it's a, his input has been uh, essential to this project. I've also had specialist advice from my colleagues in areas where I'm not an expert, which is anything but organic chemistry. Really. And I'd like to specifically acknowledge the J Model JS Model team. You'll notice that my animations all worked beautifully, those were all done in JavaScript, no Java in sight today. And that's as a result of the work of Bob Hansen, uh, who's a phenomenon, frankly, an absolutely astonishing guy. And he produces new features as, as quick as you can imagine. Makes it all possible. These are my sources of support, as I say, principally Physical Sciences Centre. I've also had support from my own university, Teaching Fellowship and Teaching Quality Enhancement Fund. They're quite keen to promote high quality teaching, which is, suits me. And I'm also the recipient of a Higher Education National Teaching Fellowship, which again, keeps the funds coming in and keeps the students coming to do it. That's the URL. If you haven't explored it already, which I hope many of you have, then please do take a look. There's much, much more there than I've had a chance to show you today. 
And I'm just going to finish there because I think it's most important to stay within my allotted time and in the evening slot. But if anyone wants to ask any questions about anything they'd like to see, just caught sight of something out of the corner of your eye, then I'd be very happy to uh, display that. So the message is, you can use computers to display chemistry in a much more realistic way. You can do it using just a website, so no specialist equipment is required for anyone using it. And you can do almost anything. Uh, I, I haven't, I promised an enzyme actually, I haven't shown one yet. We've got some enzymes in there, I can put that up here at the end. There's no, almost no limit, except for the, when it gets really, really big, things slow down. But otherwise, it, it, you can display almost anything. So your imagination is the limit. <coughs> you have to decide what you want to see, and then you can display it. And that's the one Achilles heel of this whole thing. We have to have thought of what you want to see. We have to have anticipated your needs. We do that, we do our best, but if there's anything else you'd like to see, then please let me know. Thank you very much. No, it's not pre-rendered, it's, it's all pre-calculated, so that for the reactions, the actual files consist of a series of frames of X, Y, Z coordinates. The rendering is all done in real time by JMOL or JSMOL. So it, it deals with the coordinates that you supply, and it just makes it appear how you like. So you can have, uh, although I didn't indicate that it's changing, you can go from sticks to ball and sticks to space fill to whatever you like on the fly. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Okay. Have you tried Google AdWords? Because if you've just been on Wikipedia, that means if you just put like a minimum bid on the words, you will get the really easily the very first place, which gets way more clicks than the second. <laughs> well, I have looked into them actually, but uh, th this runs on a financial shoestring, and so the idea of actually paying for advertising doesn't appeal to me. But I, I take your point, you can promote things mm. further if you really want to. Yeah. I'm quite happy with second, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, my question's a little bit more uh, big picture, I guess. Right. Um, how possible do you think it is for like, a newly minted academic to um, spend time devoted to teaching and uh, creating resources like this rather than you know, like, having to do this sort of cutting edge research that most people? Well, it depends. I think it will vary from university to university. In, in Liverpool, we actually have a recognition of the possibility that academic staff might wish to pursue a career in teaching and scholarship. So we actually have a, a distinct pathway uh, with promotion that allows people to advance without having to do the cutting-edge research. Yeah. Uh, there's also, of course, the research pathway as well. And I'm probably being filmed, so I should Careful say here. But the, the, it's fair to say that the recognition at the highest level hasn't quite been proven in that system. And it will vary from institution to institution how possible that is. Some universities very much recognise the importance of teaching. Other universities stress the importance of research. I imagine in this university, research would be very highly emphasised. But I think increasingly there, there really is a belief that teaching is important, students are an important part of universities. And so producing high quality teaching resources, high quality teaching methods, must be recognised as making that important contribution. Mm -hmm. But it's an important question. If you're embarking on that particular path, uh, it's a brave person who chooses out of the gate to go for teaching and scholarship. We have a couple in Liverpool at the moment. But uh, it's 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 a new thing. I could also happen here. Does that correlate with the recent increase in tuition fees? Uh, in terms of time, it does. But I don't think that one drove the other. Uh, I think that it was, in our case, a recognition that we wanted to have more <coughs> teaching specialists, and we had some excellent candidates on hand who were successful in the competitive process. And so it, and it's worked brilliantly because they are able to devote their time and their energies to the teaching in the same way that academic staff traditionally devote their time and their energies to research. And so in our department, as a result, we have all manner of initiatives and developments 
that are moving us on dramatically. So I think it, it's a question of balance, really. You, you, it's important to have such people because they will drive the teaching forward. If, if you want to give, a, if you're asking for a personal perspective, I have lapsed into this probably as a result of being involved in writing that dreadful book. <laughs> Can very interested in the whole time. Are there any plans to convey it to a slot or a top app? I'm often asked that. Uh, the good news is, as it's running JavaScript, it actually works today on tablets and smartphones. There is a bit of a hardware problem in the sense that as you go to more complex systems, the speed with which the rendering takes place can become a problem. Now the good news is, if you use Apple products, their latest chip, the A7, does a fabulous job in terms of rendering these posts. I've tested it on my own phone, it, the, the speed is really impressive. But if you have older devices, then I regard that as a significant problem. But that's going to get better. As all the devices get faster, as JavaScript is optimised, the browsers get better, it's just going to get faster and better. So, it already works on those devices. And as a result, I haven't paid any attention towards actually building a specific app. Uh, but I keep getting asked. I just don't know anything about the programming side of that. But it's, it's an attractive idea. It would be big, though. It would be about a gigabyte and stuff. Well, okay, so before I go, there are two announcements. Uh, the first one is that 